Father says, lead my people back to me. How do you do that? They have to be willing to be led back to him. Because first of all, they have to see and realize, wait a minute. What am I what am I worshiping? What am I believing here that I'm so far off base that the father says we need led back to him. I wanna give you an example. <laughs> I wanna give you an example. Alright. Everybody says that the law is dead. The churches today, if you say, are, are you celebrating Passover? They'll look at you cross-eyed and beat you over your head with their Easter bunnies and jelly beans. Oh, we don't have to celebrate those. Those are over with. <laughs> They'll have a hard time during the millennial reign of Christ, don't you think? Because when David's ruling from Jerusalem during the 1,000-year millennial reign, they're observing the feast. There was no hiccup in God's plan. They did not stop for 2,000 years. They did not begin and then say, okay, during the age of the church, the law is over. We no longer celebrate the feast. We, we just do we celebrate on Sundays. We put up Christmas trees. And we put jelly beans and Easter eggs and call it a resurrection. And then comes the millennial reign of Christ. David rules from Jerusalem. And they're back to celebrating the feast because the Bible says they'll be observing Passover. The kings of the earth will be going up to Jerusalem for Passover once a year. So why is something that was supposedly dead and done away with implemented again? It was never dead and done away with, folks. The churches said it was, but the Father never said it was. The Father had a timeline instituted through his feasts and appointed times with mankind. And he wanted them to observe it because it kept in their memories the timelines and the events of the past, the present, and the future of what was coming. But the churches wiped all that away. They said that the, the law was nailed to the cross. You always hear Satan's hiss and all that stuff. Let me tell you something about the Torah laws because... It's, the one thing you'll hear from church people is how there's so many you could never keep them straight. Do you know all the laws today in your own state? No. But you know the main ones, and you know to observe and honor those. This is no different. There were 613 Torah laws. And a large portion of these related to sacrifices and offerings which can only be made in the temple. Yahushua was the perfect sacrifice. And there is no temple today. So a large portion of those laws don't even pertain to today. They no longer exist. Then there was a huge bulk of the laws that pertained only to the theocratic state of Israel. It, 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 they were in regards to the king, the supreme court, the system of justice, and they can't be observed today either because there's no theocratic state of Israel. And then there was laws that only pertain to the Levitical priests. Again, there's no temple, there's no Levitical priests. So most of these laws don't even affect people today. And yet all you hear from the churches is how confusing and burdensome they would be. Really? There's too much tedious stuff in the laws. Well, some of the laws pertain to Sabbath day, which is worshipped on the seventh day, which is Saturday. And they tell you what you can and can't do. What's the big deal about that? It's a day of relaxation. And they protected everybody equally. It wasn't a day for the men to relax and the women to stay in the kitchen busy all day having to cook for their, their lazy butts. It was a day for everybody to relax. Or vice versa, if you're a man who cooks and you got a lazy wife. It was a day for everybody to relax. 
Then there was dietary laws. No shellfish or pork. You want some worms with that pork, folks? Pork is the most nasty animal you can eat. In fact, I was told by an Israeli Jew that it is a crossbreed between it's it's a it's a pork, a rat, and a human, or a, a boar, a boar, a rat, and a human, and that's how they got pork. So when you eat pork, you're eating some kind of semblance of human flesh. And when you eat pork, there's all kinds of worms and pestilences that's in the meat that then takes up root in your digestive system and makes you bloated and sick and get diseases. The same thing with shellfish. Shellfish are bottom feeders. They scavenge the bottom of the oceans and they eat crap. And then you turn around and eat that shellfish. There's always good reasons for the laws that he had his people follow. Another one was praying after you eat. Most of us have been taught to pray before we eat. Torah law says to pray after you eat. And then there's other ones of cleanliness, washing your hands after you use the restroom. Oh, yeah, these these are real burdensome, folks. They're real burdensome. And yet Paul screams throughout 13 of his Masonic books in the New Testament, the law is dead. The law is a curse. Let me tell you some other things why Paul screamed, the law is dead and the law is a curse. Because Paul was a Pharisee. And this is the sect Yahushua called the vipers and sons of the devil. Now if you look at the group Pharisees online, it makes it look like they were the party of the people. That 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 the ancient Jews to the Pharisees and blah blah blah. It's not true. Yeshua called them vipers and sons of the devil. Paul was from the tribe of Benjamin. And if you read Genesis chapter 49, 27, when Jacob's sons received their blessings, Benjamin was noted as the raving wolf. He said, Benjamin shall raven as a wolf. In the morning he shall devour the prey, and at night he shall divide the spoil. The tribal standard of Benjamin was the wolf. And Paul was a wolf from the tribe of Benjamin through his mother, who was from the tribe of Benjamin. Paul's father was not Jewish. His mother was. But see, in Jewish lineage, your lineage is based on a Jewish mother's birth, not the father. So the fact that his mother was Jewish made him a Jew. You know what the saying is, mama's baby, papa's maybe. It was the Jewish mother that made them a Jew. His father was a Roman. He worked for the Roman government, spent a lot of time in the Roman bathhouses, where Paul did. Nowhere in any kind of history of Paul will you read where he had a girlfriend or wife. Anywhere. But he spent a lot of time in Roman bathhouses with people like Gamaliel, private tutor. How how does a poor boy end up with one of the, the, the most elite tutors of the Jews? He was the founding father. He was the grandson of Hillel, who was the founding father of the Pharisees. Paul was a rich guy. His father was a Roman official. Paul was studying to be a lawyer. His mother, uh, I'm gathering from my earlier studies about Paul that his mother had died when he was born. And so he had a, 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 an anger, uh, 
anger towards women because of his mother dying and leaving him when she was when he was born. Uh, he pretty much grew up with tutors at that point, with Gamaliel. But the Pharisees wanted to protect the status quo. Because in the Jewish Constitution Bill of Rights, which is basically what the Torah was, it was their Bill of Rights. It protected them from oppression and protected their liberty. They had a social security system set up. Every person was entitled to social security. And this means that uh, if anyone fell on hard times, that the communities would give them the money they needed to get back up on their feet. And the people that would, the communities that would give them the loans to get back on their feet weren't allowed to charge interest rates. You know how you get a, a, a school loan today, a house loan today? Terrible. You get a mortgage, by the time you get it paid off, you've paid three times what the house is worth. You get a $100,000 mortgage, it'll be over 300000 by the time you get it paid off. This is what they do to you. And this is what the Torah prevented them from doing to people, charging them interest rates on loans. Corporate monopolies weren't allowed. The country's wealth was shared among all the people equally. It was an equal and fair distribution of wealth. So if you can imagine... All this oil that America has, it would belong to the people. And all the oil we sold overseas, other countries, all that money that would come in would be divided equally among the people. There were no corporations. There were no BPs and Exxons and Shells, Speedway, Sheets, Marathons. There were no monopolies. And, and resources that belong to the country. Like all these private bottled water companies. Water is a resource of the people of the country they live in. All that money would be equally divided amongst the people if you were selling bottled water. So there were no monopolies. The people shared in the country's wealth. Bankers and accountants. Their role wasn't to fleece the people... It was to oversee the money and make sure it was evenly distributed. If anybody in a community had to have loans to get back up on their feet, that debt would be wiped out after seven years. That's what Jubilee was. It was a wiping out of debt. So if you had to file bankruptcy then the, the the community would give you some money to get back on your feet, and you would pay that money back. So you paid on it for five or six years. Whatever you owed during the seventh year would be forgiven. You, you know that that debt would be canceled. That's why it was called forgiveness of debts a jubilee year. And it wasn't the poor people of communities that were required to give their money to people who were struggling and needed it. It was the, part, it was the job of the rich people. Now they, they, didn't get, they didn't get to sit around and hawk up the numbers in their bank accounts to, to tens of millions and billions. If they had money, they had to share it with those who didn't. They had to give them loans. And then the people would pay back on it for six years, and seventh year they would be forgiven of the debt. So the rich people weren't just giving their money away. They were getting it back. But these were the kinds of laws that the Pharisees were against. Because if you look at the, the Federal Reserve System today and the, the, the satanic 1% elitists who run our government today, those are the Pharisees of back in the day. Charging, they, they were charging the people exorbitant amount of interest rates 
they had they had taken over the people with their smooth talking, led them away from the Torah laws. Uh, servants, slaves, had to be released every seven years. Paul was against that. The whole book of Philemon was about that. His slave Onesimus, he was supposed to set him free, and he didn't want to because they liked to keep their slaves. And so when Yahushua arrives on the scene, and he sees what's going on, that these sons of the devil and these vipers and led the people away from the true intent and the laws of the Torah. I told them, hold on, oh, it's, we're doing it this way now. And, they, and they, was, they were charging the people on their loans, and they were making them slaves to the bankers and the taxmen. And, and Yahushua tried to stand up and say, hey, that's not the intent of what the law is. You're leading them astray with your apostasies and your wrong teachings. And so they hated him for that. They hated him. That's why they cheered him on to die on the cross. Because they hated him for trying to steer the people out of their apostasies and wrong beliefs and teachings and back into the truth. And he was a threat to the rich 1% that had been, that taken control of the people and were leading them astray. He was a threat to them. That's why they wanted him dead. He was trying to teach them the right way, get back to the right way. He was trying to say, okay, you guys have been lied to. These wolves have taken over the churches and are leading you down the wrong path. This is what the real path is. And that's why they wanted him dead. Interestingly enough, Paul's father was a, a Mithraic initiate of the day. And back in that day, Mithraism is identical to what we call Freemasonry. They worship Lucifer. Mithra was Lucifer. And today in Freemasonry, they worship the God of Light, who is Lucifer. And the whole Damascus Road thing, the blinding light. Hello, folks. What does what does Yeshua say in Matthew? He he says this several times. He says, uh, if if you if you go to him, you have to have childlike faith. And 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 coming up and trying to find him any other way makes you a, a, a thief and a robber. I can't remember the verse. Don't you think it would be kind of nice if all of our unsaved loved ones had a blinding light Damascus Road revelation to stop them from going to hell? He never did it. It never happened. And I'll tell you why. Because when you study Josephus and you study Damascus back in that certain period of time of the Christian persecutions, Damascus was a safe city. It was a safe haven. And yet Paul says he was on his way to Damascus to persecute Christians. <laughs> it was a safe haven. It was a safe city. They weren't being persecuted in Damascus at that time. There's so many holes in his story. He says he was with a garrison of soldiers on his way to Damascus. How come none of these soldiers, where, where were they? How come none of them could be found to verify Paul's story? He says, well, they, they saw light, but they didn't hear anything. In another passage, he says, uh, they, heard, they heard something but didn't see the light. He says it four different ways in his books of Acts and 1 Corinthians. Four different versions of the road to Damascus story. And the thing is, one of the in, uh, initiation rituals of masonry and Mithraism, they call it the blinding light ritual where you get blinded by a great light and then you see all the errors you've been in and you embrace the, the God of Illuminati or Illumination, this God of light, whatever. It's actually a ritual in Freemasonry. And it was a ritual back then. And what they did was they played it out again for Paul 
so he'd have something to tell the Christians about his divine revelations. Because he needed some kind of a basis to come in and say, hey, I'm the new one now. I'm apostle number 13, and I get all my info from divine revelations, and now you follow me. That's basically what he did. There were 12 apostles, not 13. Their names are on the gates of the New Jerusalem. Paul's name is not included. The office of apostle was closed after Matthias replaced Judas. Paul didn't replace Judas. Matthias did. And it's at that point, the title and office of apostle was closed because no one else would ever qualify after that to have walked and been a part of Yahushua's ministry on earth. That was a requirement to be an apostle. Paul didn't even qualify to be an apostle. He had never met Yeshua. He had never talked to him. He had never been a part of the ministry. He didn't qualify. And that's even stated in one of his own books in, in Acts chapter 1. The qualifications to be an apostle. And he's led Christianity away from the truth, away from the teachings of Yeshua and the early apostles for almost 2,000 years now. Get back to the truth, folks. 